Hello, my name is Laura Mucci. I'm an archaeologist, researcher and experimental potter from Cornwall, currently working in post-excavation and at the Royal Cornwall Museum. In 2021, I graduated from University College Dublin with a Master's of Science degree in Experimental Archaeology and Material Culture. What is Trevisca ware? Trevisca ware was a regional pottery type and an integral part of the material culture of the late Neolithic to the late Bronze Age periods in Cornwall. Characterised by its usage of gabroic clay, this was extensively exploited for crafting ceramics within Cornwall, particularly during the Bronze Age. Gabroic clay vessels have an extremely long period of use, from the late Neolithic right through to the Romano-British period. Where does it come from? Trevisca ware comes from Cornwall, a peninsula in the southwest of Britain. The gabroic clay and its inclusions have been traced to the Lizard Peninsula. Gabroic clay of the Lizard is easily accessible along the water's edge, and these deposits are thought to comprise the majority of this material in Britain. Gabroic clay derives from degraded gabbro, a coarse-grained, mafic intrusive igneous rock, which constitutes much of the Earth's oceanic crust formed at mid-ocean ridges. Why use gabroic clay? Trevisca ware may have been influenced by more than one factor, such as cultural and ceremonial, but through the experiential and the experimental, technological and material reasons for gabroic clay usage can be explored. It was hypothesized that gabroic clay may have been elicited for use due to its workability, or perhaps for its ability to be fired at low temperatures and or its thermal properties. I have always been fascinated by the prehistoric pottery in the Royal Cornwall Museum's collections. After working closely with the Historic England Records Office and Cress and Kerno, the Cornish Archives, the parameters of the data set were established. An imaginary line was drawn at Camborne and the study focused on early Bronze Age Trevisca ware found at sites between here and the River Tamar on the Cornwall Devon border. The museum team, especially its collections manager Jenny, were amazing in facilitating my in-person work and we compiled a data set of early Bronze Age Trevisca ware, beakers and food vessels, all found within the study area. I examined the data set to gain experiential insight into its craftsmanship, marks of production, inclusion type and grain size, drawing lines, etc. Sourcing and processing. As the archaeology is limited, assumptions are made about ancient methodologies and tools used in a prehistoric society through macro and micro observations of any surviving archaeology. These actualistic production skills are used or approximated wherever possible to make replicas. However, within a modern context, irrespective of the methodology employed, it is impossible to replicate a Bronze Age vessel exactly. Stage 1. Sourcing the clay. Research was enacted along the lizard to decipher whether the gabroic clay could be easily sourced. Two days were spent collecting the clay from colluvial fluvial deposits along the coast. Stage 2. Processing the clay. It was estimated how much clay would be needed for the experiments and more was collected than was necessary. It was left to dry for about a week before being grinded down into smaller particles with locally sourced muller stones. When the clay could be passed through a 6.35 mm sieve, it was bagged and packed, ready to post to Dublin, where it underwent its secondary processing. It was ground down further until it could pass through a 0.5 mm sieve. Stage 3. Processing the inclusions. The inclusion selected for use, as well as its grain size, was determined by various literature sources on Trevisca ware and macroscopic observations of the data set. There have been few petrological analyses on Trevisca ware, but those existing found feldspar to be the most common inclusion. While some Trevisca ware had larger particle sizes, circa 5 mm, inclusions of this size were rare. The most common particle size for inclusions was 2 mm or less, and so burnt feldspar was crushed until it could pass through a 2 mm sieve. Making and firing. Stage 4. Making the vessels. The amount of inclusion to use in the four vessels was determined by firing test tiles with different concentrations in each. The most successfully fired tiles contained inclusions at 35% of the overall volume. They seemed to agree with macroscopic observations of the vessels and were supported by several experimental archaeology projects using similar materials. Hypotheses were made as to how the Trevisca ware vessels may have been constructed. Then the experiential, employing different methods of crafting to see which best suited the gabroic clay. Whilst important to widen the data set in future and enact further observations, it appears likely that Trevisca vessels could have been crafted using a flat base with flat sections added, building up the sides. 
This method complements the data set where we often see probable joining lines running horizontally at various points around vessels and visible surface level interior cracking. It will explain why the thickness of the walls of Harlem Bay Urn, my particular inspiration, was relatively homogeneous. If the coil method had been employed, the sides would generally be thinner the closer they got to the rim. However, these methods may not have been the case for ultravisca wear, as certain vessels in the secondary data set were relatively symmetrical and may have been constructed using the pinch pot method with flat side sections added afterwards. Stage five, actualistically firing the vessels. The vessels were fired as actualistically as possible to simulate ancient technologies, while ancient craftsmanship is simulated and considered through real first-hand practice of working with gabroic clay. I have never worked with such a frustrating clay, leading me to believe that it was probably not chosen for its workability. Its apparent lack of plasticity may shed light as to why there exists many gabroic admixture vessels. As gabroic clay, especially when inclusions are added, is difficult to work with, it is not surprising that travisqueware vessels often appear to have been repurposed, with diverse uses and functions before deposition. The gabroic fabric is very sturdy once fired, which may account for why so many vessels have survived either fully or relatively intact, even to the present day. The factor of survivorship bias must be considered when comparing the amount of surviving travisqueware to that of other prehistoric ceramics. Experiment one. Testing the percentage of overall volume to the inclusions. It was necessary to ascertain which percentage of overall volume would be used for the inclusion content in the replica vessels. From the macroscopic observations, the inclusion content seemed to fall within the range of 20% to 50% of the overall volume. From consulting other experimental ceramic projects, the optimum range for inclusion was found to fall between 20% and 40% of overall volume, with toughness increasing up to 50%, but strength decreasing thereafter. As 35% corresponded to the data set and was within the optimum range, it was chosen as one of the test percentages. Due to time constraints, it was decided to test only three percentages, and so the other two were decided by choosing one which fell at the lower end of the optimum range, 20%, and one which was close to the higher end, but with the same interval away as the other two, so 50%. Six tiles were made, two of each inclusion percentage, and these were made as homogeneously as possible. Three tiles were actualistically fired, while the other three were kiln fired to see the effects of kiln firing on the gabroic fabric. The 35% tile was the easiest to work with, while the 20% tile was very plastic and the 50% tile was prone to cracking. The actualistic tiles were fired first and the temperature and timings of the fire were used to inform the kiln firing, 800 degrees Celsius for 120 minutes. All of the actualistically fired tiles resembled Travisca wear and were successfully low fired agreeing with Borlase's comment in the 1870s on its barely baked nature. The tiles were fired between 500 and 800 degrees Celsius, which infers that Travisca wear can be fired at relatively low temperatures and may explain prehistoric inclinations towards the gabroic clay usage. Ironically, three of the vessels were kiln fired in order to save time, but the kiln ended up causing more harm than good. Initial observations showed that the kiln ceramics had slaked. The cracking seemed to precipitate from the inclusions, which had turned black likely due to chemical reactions undergone during the kiln firing process. Unsurprisingly, the slaking continued until the entire collection crumbled entirely. Calcareous clays sometimes cause slaking. So the two 35% inclusion tiles, the same inclusion percentage as the replica vessels, were placed under a portable X-ray fluorescence reader. It was found that the calcium content of the area tested on both tiles amounted to less than 8%, for the actualistic tiles 2.77%, and the kiln fired tiles 2.55%. Thus, the slaking had been caused by other reasons. As the slaking precipitated from the inclusions, they appeared to be the culprit. After much thought, it was established that the issue was not with a feldspar specifically, as the actualistic firing was successful, but rather the combination of feldspar mixed with the firing conditions of the kiln. As we can see from the table, there are three crucial differences between actualistic firing and kiln firing. It was hypothesised that the fourth and final vessel, if fired actualistically, would be fired successfully, reacting similarly to the tiles and post-firing would resemble Travisca wear, just as the actualistic tiles had done. Experiment 2. Breaking the fourth wall. The most important thing to remember with actualistic ceramic firing is that it is crucial to warm the vessel slowly, as the most common cause of failure in pottery firing is spalling at the base. The vessel was examined post-firing against the criteria. It survived well, showed no signs of cracking, and as predicted, reacted similarly to the tiles. It was light brown, low fired, with white clear inclusions, just like Travisca wear. The actualistic low firing of the vessel suggested that gabroic clay from the lizard could be fired at temperatures reached in an average bonfire.
Not only can gabbroic clay be fired at low temperatures, it may be that it can only be fired at low temperatures, perhaps affected by the feldspar, and it relies on the variable conditions of outdoor firing to be successful. Ironically, the vessel which had been made as a spare and almost did not get made played a starring role. Post firing reflections. Gabroic clay is a short clay as discovered through the jam jar test, which revealed that there was a noticeable percentage of silt within the clay matrix. The addition of feldspar as an inclusion added to the shortness of the clay, probably accounting for the difficulty in working gabroic clay the higher the inclusion percentage is. The less gabroic clay is worked, the better. This helps to avoid cracking. Experience agrees that there seems no good technological reason to add additional temper clay to the lizard's gabroic clay, Williams 1985. It was therefore postulated that while technological and cultural motivations may have played a role in why lizard gabroic clay was used, the inclusions were more likely to have been added for ceremonial and or stylistic purposes. It is geologically possible that inclusions were sourced from the same geographical area as the clay, rather than the potter's location. Therefore, rural gabroic clay may not have travelled far as suggested by Parker Pearson, 1990. However, during field surveys, especially in the 80s, there was found no evidence at the lizard for production centres, although there is no reason to expect any, as vessels could easily have been made on a small scale within a few hours, leaving no trace behind. The production methodology seems straightforward, so the crafting of these vessels was probably not specialised and could theoretically have been enacted by anyone. Autochthony may also have played a role, wherein the lizard was a pilgrimage destination perhaps visited annually to make pots. If tradition played a key role in constructing Bronze Age barrows and in the deposition of Trevisca ware, there is no reason its influence could not extend to production. It seems that this regional pottery type was more than just a physical vessel, but part of a tangible heritage of what is now modern day Cornwall, with a collective knowledge of its properties ensuring its longevity. Limitations. One, there were other possibilities for inclusions in the experimental vessels, but only Feldspar was pursued. Two, similarly, gabroic clay could have been sourced from more than one location. Three, most petrographic work on Trevisca were focused on the origins of the clay itself, so more petrological analyses on the inclusions are required, using more up-to-date techniques. Four, due to time constraints, it was not possible to make many replica vessels. Five, as three replica vessels were lost to the kiln, planned follow-up experiments could not be enacted. Six, actualistic firing is variable. The possible effects of this on the ceramics were acknowledged, but not explored in detail. 7. The scope of the study was relatively limited, being a master's study enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Where to go next? There are many experimental avenues that could be pursued, all adding valuable discussions to the rich topic of Trevisca ware. 1. To remove as much silt from the clay samples as possible using levigation. The results from this could be compared to the more finely made Trevisca ware. Smoother gabroic vessels deemed admixtures may not be so, but rather a result of using levigated clay. Two. To explore further potential technological motivations for using Cornish gabroic clay, such as thermal shock resistance and thermal conductivity. Three, to enact experiments on a range of replica gabroic rich vessels, exploring the usage of varying inclusion types and percentages. Was gabroic clay added to other clays to improve their thermal properties? Or were other clays added to gabroic clay to improve its workability? Were admixtures the best of both worlds? Four, each of the above could be taken further by sourcing gabroic clay from different deposits. Experimental studies such as these would complement material culture studies, such as looking at decoration, and in turn help make a solid contribution to regional syntheses. Considering history pre-written records, there is no way for any findings of any research or experimental project to be 100% conclusive, and the shortcomings, which are inevitable to any methodology, must be acknowledged, addressed to be eliminated wherever possible, and ultimately accepted. Regional studies such as this, while geographically limited in scope, constitute vital threads in the overall tapestry of Bronze Age Britain. The importance of enacting interdisciplinary studies and the dynamism, reciprocity and benefits in doing so must never be underestimated. I am eager to explore the rich plethora of subtopics concerning Bronze Age ceramics. Ultimately, what Trevisca Ware seems to represent is the apex at which materiality, technology and culture collide and would benefit greatly from additional experimental research projects in the future. A massive thank you to Royal Cornwall Museum and UCD for all their help in facilitating our ongoing collaborations, especially Jenny Woolcock and Dr Brendan O'Neill. My supervisors, Dr Neil Carlin and Dr Demetra McHale, and Dr Brendan O'Neill of CMAT, the Centre of Experimental Archaeology and Material Culture.